Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, members of this commission. I'll proceed with the prepared statement, and then we can go to many of these very rich questions that you all have raised in the opening statements. Again, it is my honor to be invited to testify before you today on the situation in Ukraine. It's a particular honor to do so before the U.S. Helsinki Commission, an organization that I have long personally valued and had lots of exchanges with over the years. Uh, let me also express my gratitude and our, the administration's gratitude for the leadership that Congress has shown with the overwhelming passage of H.R. 4152 and S. 2183 in support of Ukraine and the Ukrainian people. That unity sent a strong bipartisan signal that the United States stands united for Ukraine at this critical moment in its history. For almost 40 years, the United States and this Commission have worked with our transatlantic allies and partners to uphold the principles of the Helsinki Final Act. Russia's actions in Ukraine are an affront to those fundamental principles. Its occupation of Crimea, rubber stamped by an illegitimate referendum conducted at the barrel of a gun, have tarnished its credibility and diminished its international standing in the eyes of Ukrainians and in the eyes of the world. Reports of human rights abuses in Crimea since the Russian occupation have also shocked the conscience. Russia has also attempted to intimidate Ukrainians by amassing more than 40,000 troops and quick strike aircraft along its borders and with trade blockades and gas price hikes, as mentioned by some of you. This week's violent occupation of government buildings in Kharkiv, in Donetsk, and in Luhansk deepen our concern. Far from a spontaneous set of events, as Secretary Kerry said yesterday before the Senate Foreign Relations Committee, these incidents bear all the harm hallmarks of an orchestrated campaign of incitement, separatism, and sabotage of the Ukrainian state, aided and abetted by the Russian security services. Today, Ukraine is a frontline state in the struggle for freedom and all the principles that this commission holds dear. The United States stands with Ukraine in its effort to forge its own path forward to a more free, peaceful, and unified future. Our approach includes four pillars with which you're very familiar. First, our bilateral and multilateral support for Ukraine and its democratic future. Second, the costs we're imposing on Russia for its aggressive actions. Third, our efforts to de-escalate the crisis diplomatically, if at all possible. And fourth, our unwavering commitment to the security of our NATO allies. I'll address each of these briefly. My longer statement includes more detail. First, we support the Ukrainian people and, and the transitional government in the courageous steps they are taking to restore economic health, democratic choice, and internal stability and security to the country. The RADA has passed landmark anti-corruption measures deficit reduction measures, and taken difficult steps to reform the energy sector. These reforms are going to require painful sacrifice from the Ukrainian people, but they will also open the way to an IMF package of up to $18 billion in support. And as you know, the United States stands ready to help as the country addresses its immense challenges. Again, we thank you for your support of the $1 billion loan guarantee, which we will provide in conjunction with IMF and EU assistance. This uh, loan guarantee will primarily go to help cushion the impact of reforms for the poorest in the Ukrainian uh, system and the most vulnerable in their society. We also have approximately $92 million in FY13 uh, state and USA funding and $86 million in FY14 state and USA funding for other kinds of assistance. This is primarily going to be directed in the areas of strengthening anti-corruption and enforcement efforts along the lines of to address some of the concerns that Senator Whitehouse raised, uh, revising public procurement legislation again in an anti-corruption direction, introducing agricultural and energy sector reforms that are badly needed, also going to rooting out corruption, improving transparency, and helping the Ukrainian people prepare for free, fair elections on May 25th. And thank you for those of you who've already traveled to Ukraine and to those of you who will travel for the elections. Very, very important to have uh, senior ranking Americans from both the executive and the legislative branch in Ukraine throughout this period. Uh, we are also working with the international community to push back against Russian propaganda, Russian lies, 
and efforts to destabilize Ukraine's regions. Uh, as you mentioned, Mr. Chairman, the OSCE has already fo uh, fielded a special monitoring mission. There are 70 monitors now in place in some 10 locations around Ukraine, including most of the at-risk cities that we've seen over the weekend, and we expect this mission can grow to up to 500 over the coming weeks. Uh, the OSC's Office for Democratic Institutions and Humanitarian Rights will also play an essential role. They'll send some thousand observers for the presidential elections, one of the highest per capita fieldings of an ODIR mission in recent transatlantic history. Second, as I said, Russia is already paying a high price for its actions, and that cost will go up if its pressure on Ukraine does not abate. Across the board, Russia has found itself isolated, disinvited, and diminished in its interactions with all of us. The President has signed two executive orders authorizing sanctions against those responsible uh, and finding that the actions and policies of the Russian government under undermine democratic processes and institutions, threaten the peace and stability and security and sovereignty and territorial integrity of Ukraine, or in the misappropriation of Ukrainian assets. These sanctions have been carefully coordinated with the EU and with our global partners. And today, we are considering further measures in response to Russia's continued pressure on Ukraine. These costs will only grow if Russia does not change course. At the same time, the President has insisted on leaving the door open for di uh, diplomacy, and we wanted to try to de-escalate this crisis peacefully, if at all possible. As you know, Secretary Kerry has met three times with Russian Foreign Minister Lavrov in, in recent weeks with the full support of the Ukrainian government at a time when Russia was refusing to meet directly with Ukraine. Earlier this week, the Russians agreed that they would finally sit down over the next 10 days with Ukraine and the EU and the, e and the U.S. to discuss de-escalation, demobilization, support for, for the elections and constitutional reform. I have to say that we don't have high expectations for these talks, but we do believe it is very important to keep that diplomatic door open, and we'll see what they bring. Even as we try to de-escalate, with Russian troops ringing Ukraine for weeks now on high alert, we cannot be complacent about the security of our NATO allies who live closest to Russia. Our message to Putin and to Russia is clear. NATO territory is inviolable. And we and our NATO allies are providing visible reassurance on land, on sea, and in the air to our Central and Eastern European members who now also live on the front lines of this conflict. More broadly, the events in Ukraine are a wake-up call for all of us. Everything we have stood for for over 40 years as a community of free nations is at risk if we allow aggressive acts to go unchecked and unpunished. As a community, North Americans and Europeans must continue to stand with the people of Ukraine as they say no or ni in Ukrainian to the tactics and brutality of the 19th century on display now, and yes or tak in Ukrainian to a 21st century future that respects their sovereignty, their choice, and their human dignity. Thank you for allowing me to be with you today.